next speaker is uh, Robert Hunt, who's a professor in the Division of uh, Engineering at Brown University. He's also director of the Institute for Molecular and Nanoscale Innovation at Brown and the scientific uh, founder of uh, Banyan uh, Environmental. He also serves as the editor of the journal Carbon. Um, his research encompasses several areas of activity, but most prominent is work on uh, carbon uh, nanomaterials, mercury capture, and the chemical basis of uh, nanotoxicity. Um, his talk is entitled Nanomaterial Design for Environmental Safety and Health. Bob? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I, for one, enjoyed yesterday's discussion very much. I was uh, very impressed with the, the depth with which our participants had thought about regulation and societal impacts of nanotechnology. Regrettably, I have not thought equally deeply about <laughs> regulation and societal impacts of nanotechnology. But maybe that's okay, because this session's about scientific considerations. So I'm here to talk about uh, this issue from the perspective of a, a physical scientist who's uh, interested in materials chemistry. And so I thought, for the purposes of this session, about how could nanoscience, which I may be able to represent to some extent, con uh, contribute to or inform this discussion. And there's some obvious things. Um, it's our job, I imagine, to provide the primary data on toxicity. That's my lab has been involved in that with collaborators, including Gunther and people from uh, around Brown University. And many people around the world are engaged in this. It's a very important topic. Um, but equally important and maybe uh, less recognized is the uh, need to, uh, for science to provide technologies for exposure assessment and exposure prevention or control. Uh, there aren't as many groups that work in this area, but it's a very important piece of what science can contribute to this area. Uh, but beyond these two things that are widely recognized, um, I think maybe science could help define the questions. We've heard from philosophers and lawyers and social scientists. So maybe somehow our unique way of thinking about things could contribute some small piece of the truth to this puzzle, and I will try to do that today. And I'd also like to talk about developing safe design principles, which relates to the title. It's actually an area of some controversy, uh, and I'd like to talk about in what cases this may be possible or may not be possible to somehow use and harness the power of nanoscience to intrinsically design materials to, to be safe. So that's what I'd like to talk about. And let me start with this. Um, carbon nanotube is the poster child of the nanotechnology movement, the most famous material, one of the most promising materials in nanotechnology. It's also one of the most materials of most concern for possible health effects. And in 2003, four time frame, a number of studies were published that suggested that maybe nanotubes could be um, a health concern. Other studies made the opposite conclusions, and it raised a big fracas about the inconsistent literature in this area. So I recently threw out all those old studies and just looked at the recent studies to see what the science was telling us in this area. And we see this, that nanotubes produce asbestos-like pathology in mice, 2008. Same year, they're promising biocompatible materials for drug delivery with no toxic side effects. They induce mesothelioma in a mouse model, but show only false toxicity through an absorptive artifact in a common assay. Cause oxidative damage to mouse lung and heart tissue. Toxic only if not purified. Less toxic to cells if functionalized, and of course more toxic to cells if functionalized. And uh, Alfred Nortmann talked about this uh, yesterday, you know, that uh, uh, this is important work we're doing, but it doesn't tend to uh, yield the kind of information that we can directly use in uh, risk assessment and regulation. And so I apologize, you know, collectively for all of us who are doing this kind of work for the kind of results that have come out in the area. But maybe it's not entirely our fault. Uh, Maybe it has to do with the question we're asking. If, if you look at this data and you want to know whether carbon uh, nanotubes in particular are toxic, I think you'll have a hard time coming with, up with an answer. But maybe that's not the, the right question. So um, it, are nanomaterials toxic? Uh, is this the right key scientific question? And this question is asked by a lot of people, especially people outside the field. And there are reasons, of course, why we think this is a concern. The small size of nanomaterials means small aerodynamic dam uh, diameter, deep lung penetration. Uh, generally, the possibility for high permeability through biological membranes, including the, the lipid bilayer. One of the most fundamental properties of nanoparticles is their ability, in some cases, to enter cells and exert whatever toxic chemistry they have inside the cell, where they get better access to the intracellular, intracellular machinery and the DNA and the proteins, et cetera, and can be more toxic than the same toxicant outside the cell that may be prevented from entry. They have high surface area, which means high surface activity. 
many materials are toxic through some sort of chemical process that occurs at the interface of, of the particle with the external medium, which means the surface. And of course, that surface can carry uh, external toxicants that would otherwise be excluded from the cell. They can ride in on the particle through the so-called Trojan horse effect, where the particle plays the role of the horse and the external toxicant plays the role of the Greeks that jumps off the particle inside the cell and somehow gets to act internally, where otherwise it would act externally. Those are general ideas, but really they're only guesses. And so the question is really, um, are nanomaterials toxic? But if you ask that, is that the key scientific question or not? And when I first started to learn about toxicology, which it was not that long ago, of course I was given a textbook with, uh, about Paracelsus, the father of toxicology. And Gunter and Alfred can laugh at my pronunciation, but he said, alle Dinge sind Gift und nichts ohne Gift. Allein die Dosis macht das an Ding kein Gift ist. And that means, uh, right, of course, that all things are toxic. And only by defining and limiting dose can something be regarded as non-toxic in that situation. And all toxicologists know that. And toxic effects have been documented for ethanol and vitamin E and, and oxygen and scuba diving is toxic and water. So everything is toxic. If this is the question, then I think we know the answer already. Of course nanoparticles are toxic, as is almost everything else, right? And that's a kind of a trivial idea, maybe, and I think this crowd is too sophisticated for this to be much of an enlightening discussion, but it is relevant, because if you look at those scientific papers on nanotoxicity, they will likely, um, by design, report toxic effects, almost certainly, because if you, um, if you don't see a biological response in your experiment, well, you will certainly up the dose, you know, and if you don't see it, then you'll change the material, and if you don't see it, then you'll change the model system, and so typically, all of the nanotox papers that we see come out do report adverse biological responses, you know, by design. So science makes, takes an incremental step forward, but the cumulative effect of all those studies is to lead to, um, to an impression that among the public and among some other people that nanoparticles are really a serious risk, you know, by the very, very nature of the kind of work that we do. If you look back on the previous slide for nanotubes, the few cases where nanotubes are reported to be non-toxic typically are not tox studies, but they come from studies of biomedical applications. So if you're developing a nanotube for a, as a drug delivery vehicle, you'll publish the paper about its efficacy and its behavior, and as an aside, you may mention that at this particular dose that you used, there were no toxic side effects. So that's a route to publication of a negative result, but normally we don't publish negative results. And our physician um, uh, participant did mention yesterday that negative results have played a big role in science, and I think in big medical studies and epidemiological studies, that's true. But in this world where we do laboratory research, it is, it's not generally true. If you can't get an adverse biological response, you'll change something until you do, and you'll publish it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's just the way it is. And so somehow this is not the right question, right? And maybe a better question would be, what are the maximum exposure levels that lead to tolerable risk? Everything is toxic, and we're just trying to figure out what those levels are for, for nanomaterials. So maybe a better question, might be, does nanoscale size render substances more hazardous? More hazardous meaning is an implied reference to some larger scale conventional material that we have some familiarity with. That seems like a reasonable question, but it's also a little bit problematic because uh, nanoparticles and nanostructures include a lot of very familiar and uh, what we think are low toxicity materials. Carbon black is uh, widely used as a negative control in most, uh, in most tox studies. You know, it's in copy toner, it's in inks, it's in auto tires. If some young person peels out in his car outside of your house and leaves a black streak on the road, he's laid down nanoparticles on the road which will degrade and enter the atmosphere. There's soot from candle flames in medieval castles. Proteins really are nanostructures, natural ones. Some fraction of the wind-borne sea salt aerosol is in the nano size range. So we're surrounded by nanoparticles of one type or another. And um, even if you do take an engineered nanoparticle like silver, most of the studies that have studied silver, nanosilver, seem to show that it's less toxic primarily than conventional silver forms. This plots the bacterial toxicity as a function of dose. We see, sure enough, that nanosilver does cause the loss of this photosynthetic yield at some concentration, but at a significantly lower concentration, the same effect is achieved by silver nitrate, the conventional chemical. So somehow generalizing about all nanoparticles, you know, based on their size, like generalizing about all chemicals, it's, I don't think, it's very useful. And uh, uh, Jim Tour is a chemist at Rice, published a paper in Nature Nano recently about meter technology, and he called it, is nanotechnology too broad to practice? And it's kind of just a provocative thing, but he asks, you know, what if we had just begun to make things at the meter length scale? Uh, so we imagine you were making small things in the lab, and now all of a sudden you've made things that are a meter in length scale. What are the intrinsic risks associated with meter kind of technologies? 
And there are some. And we saw on um, Maria's uh, presentation that if you, the gravitational potential energy of things at the meter scale becomes significant. So if they break or you lose control of them, you can be hurt, harmed. You know, car accidents are about when meter technology goes awry. Or if you make chemicals at a small scale, they're hazardous. But if you make them at a meter scale, you have a truck bomb or a car bomb. There are intrinsic hazards associated with that length scale. But none of us would imagine trying to regulate um, somehow all those unrelated technologies on the basis of their common size. So it's pretty challenging to do what this group is trying to do, rationally decide how to regulate nanomaterials. So somehow this idea also isn't uh, good enough. And uh, here's um, just some things to consider. This talk is full of opinions, and here are some, so please take these with a grain of salt. But uh, in our world, at least, nanoparticles are you know, really chemical products. And their chemical structure, to us, is their primary identity. You know, their nano size is kind of a secondary identity. And most of their properties derive from this chemical composition and bonding. But we have to understand that those properties and those behaviors can be modulated in some way by the nanoscale dimension. They can be more toxic. They can be less toxic. But they may be different. And this is really all we can say from a very abstract uh, point of view without actual data. And what we're trying to do in, in this area, really, is for individual materials, or at least ty or types or classes of materials, to understand how this nanoform modulates its toxicity or its behavior. And the real goal is to find out which cases deserve special concern or treatment. That's our kind of point of view. And our, I guess, means largely me. Uh, but the other problem, the question I um, promised to talk about, and one that I have more to say about, is whether we can engineer nanomaterials for safety. And this is the title of the talk. And this sounds like a great thing. No one's against it. But there's two strong schools of thought about whether it's possible. And some people think, well, toxicity is a highly specific property. So we can um, you know, mitigate it by somehow modifying the material or reformulating it in some way. And we know chromium-6 is toxic and chromium-3 is not. You shift the position of a chlorine atom on a polyaromatic poly compound. You can change its toxicity greatly. Our biological systems are built on high degree of chemical specificity. Small changes in things can make all the difference. And the person who spoke just now about pharmaceutical technology would know that. So it only makes sense that we could harness this power of nanoscience where we claim to have the ability to um, produce molecular perfection through precise control of atomic position. If we really have that ability or are striving for it, why can't we use it to make materials that aren't just, um, that aren't just uh, interesting or effective or useful, but also biologically benign. We ought to be able to use nanoscience to create these things. But that's actually um, only one school of thought. There's a strong school of thought that believes that modifying nanomaterials to reduce their toxicity will somehow compromise the features that make them attractive or effective. And uh, very important people here in the country um, believe this and think that, well, a knife is interesting because it's sharp. And you can dull the knife, but it's not so useful after that, right? The same property that makes it um, effective might also make it toxic. Um, sharks are hazardous, granted. And you can have a toothless shark, but maybe it wouldn't be a shark anymore. And so what I have today in my talk is a series of, sort of vignettes, research vignettes, some snippets of science from, from our lab that um, I'll present. And at the end, maybe we can collectively form an opinion about which of these two things might be more, uh, more nearly the truth. And the first one, and I'll go through these kind of quickly. But the first one has to do with the effect of nanotubes on cells. It has to do with the effect of nanotubes on neurons. Nanotubes are now being widely laid down as scaffolds for neuronal tissue engineering to guide the growth of, uh, of, of, of cells. And uh, neurons contain um, voltage-gated calcium ion channels. So the electrical signal comes down and then act opens up this voltage-gated calcium channel. Calcium rushes in, causes the fusion with these synaptic vesicles and the release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. And we, left, and we worked on it with uh, some in investigators who study voltage-gated calcium ion channels through a technique called whole cell patch clamp. So you attach an electrode to a cell that contains only that ion channel. You give it a voltage, and you watch the um, operation of the channel. And so here, if you put a little voltage um, top hat function on this system, you get current. The channel's open. Calcium flows in. You measure the current. And we found that carbon nanotubes um, dramatically inhibit the, the action of these voltage-gated calcium ion channels. At parts per million, single-wall nanotubes just passed over these cells will inhibit the action of these voltage-gated calcium ion channels. And there have been reports in the literature of this, and it's why we took a look at it, and we found it was true. But then we did an experiment in which we put the nanotubes in um, a buffer, removed the nanotubes by ultrafiltration, and repeated the experiment. 
and you get the same effect, the same effect. You know, it's like the mere memory of nanotubes having been present in the buffer was sufficient to cause this effect. The mere memory. I'm a Harry Potter fan. That's where I got that prose from because uh, in book two, the mere memory of Voldemort and Ginny Weasley's diary was enough to cause all this problem. So if you appreciate that, the mere memory of nanotubes was enough to cause this problem. And it turns out that nanotubes contain catalyst residues. And you can study sub-PPM levels of nickel and yttrium uh, that come off of these nanotubes in the same buffer. You can, do, I can, you can go to the controls and put the same amounts of nickel and yttrium into the system. And it turns out that this problem is related to yttrium release entirely. Tiny amounts of yttrium are potent blockers for calcium, voltage-gated calcium ion channels. And what really happens in the system is this. The carbon nanotube, the primary structure is a tube of carbon, but always invariably attached to that tube of carbon are, 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 are catalyst particles covered by carbon shells. And those shells look like they cover the particles, but they don't entirely. They're defects. And that particle corrodes with oxygen and protons to yield nickel and yttrium, sub part per million levels in solution. Yttrium is a wonderful calcium mimic, has the same size, same ionic radius, but it's trivalent. It goes into this selectivity filter, this pocket that, uh, that, that, that is uh, found in these engineered um, voltage-gated calcium ion channels. It displaces the calcium and it blocks the channel. I like to present this because it's an example of an adverse biological effect that has nothing whatsoever to do with the primary material that we're designed to use. Right? And, and this is fixable. All we need to do is find a way to purify these nanotubes in a way that does not yield bioavailable yttrium. So um, this, uh, by the way, this came up yesterday, and it's kind of a generally regarded idea in our area about how particles, nanoparticles that contain metals may be toxic. They often, whether it's a nanotube that has metals embedded in it or whether it's a metallic nanoparticle, we often are concerned with whether those materials release toxicants in the extracellular space, which may get into the cell, or more commonly, can the cell actively take up these particles by endocytosis or phagocytosis? And then in this acidified um, lysosome at a pH of 4 to 5, you get acid-enhanced corrosion of these metals, release of the metal, and you increase the inventory of this essentially chemical toxicant inside the cell, which then can um, be toxic by a variety of different mechanisms. That's a very common way to think about a nanotoxicity for a metal-containing particle, a physical, a biophysical mechanism that brings the particle inside the cell, and then a chemical, chemical mechanism that degrades the particle and releases some active metal ion that is toxic, a combination of a physical and chemical process uh, that together work to make uh, this material more toxic, potentially, than, say, soluble nickel. So here's a second vignette. And it's somewhat similar in that we put single wall nanotubes in cell culture medium and then removed them and grew cells in the medium that had been exposed to the nanotubes. And you can see the inhibition of growth in um, liver cell growth uh, due to the presence of nanotubes. But again, to the prior presence of nanotubes, not the presence of nanotubes during the experiment. So I don't know why this always happens to us, you know. Uh, but that's the way it is. And this time it turns out not to be metal release, but we found that carbon nanotubes with their very high hydrophobic surface area will reach out and selectively adsorb certain micronutrients from solution. And one of the things they do, they selectively adsorb folic acid. So at even low concentrations, nanotubes will reach out and deplete the folic acid from the medium in this experiment. And these are human cells, so they can't make their own folate. They need to get it from the medium through these shuttle proteins uh, in the membrane. Um, and so nanotubes, if present, either with the cell or beforehand, can serve as a competitive sink for folic acid and sort of starve these cells for the nutrients they need to grow. Uh, this is an example of, again, this could be reported as toxicity, but it turns out to be more of a kind of an artifact that you would see in, uh, in a cell culture system. And our cell culture work, if you look through the literature, is just full of artifacts of this kind that we just don't understand because we've never used these kinds of high surface area, hydrophobic kinds of materials in these experiments before. It also depends on type. If we, here's we're studying the, folate, the adsorption of folic acid onto nanotubes. If you functionalize these nanotubes to make them water-loving or hydrophilic, you can suppress that adsorption entirely. So this effect, if it is a concern for nanotubes, can be certainly changed by altering their surface structure. Our lab also works on nanosilver. And uh, nanosilver is the single uh, largest uh, nanoproduct made today in terms of number of products. And people put it in socks. And if you put a sock in the SEM, I don't know why you would do that, but uh, Paul Westerhoff did. It's kind of crazy. I can imagine what his SEM technician said when he came down with a sock to put in the SEM. But you can see then uh, clusters of silver nanoparticles that are meant to kill microbes in the sock and keep you from washing them. I could use that on this trip. Uh, silver is you know, a broad-spectrum antibiotic. 
It's also known toxicant to aquatic organisms. It could be toxic to beneficial bacteria in the soil or in, in human beings. And so, but the question here is a different one, in my opinion. It's not necessarily about the unique properties of nanosilver because of its small size. It's whether nanosilver presents a unique nano risk or not. You know? An earlier talk said, well, bulk silver is, in, bulk silver is inert, and nanosilver is biologically active. But are, should we really be comparing nanosilver to bulk silver? If we're trying to understand the risks of nanosilver, what's our kind of proper frame of reference? Or what's a useful frame of reference to look at nanosilver? And I would think that the useful frame of reference is conventional silver antibiotic, which is the salt, not bulk silver, but silver plus. And so, you know, one theory, and this was talked about yesterday for silver's antibacterial action and its toxicity, is that these silver particles, which are yellow, if you haven't seen them before, do slowly release, um, apparently, silver ions. And those silver ions bind to thiol groups and to thiol-containing enzymes, and, and they cause antibacterial action and toxicity. There are other theories, but this is the leading theory. And so, really, this, is the, this would explain why silver plus tends to be more toxic than silver, because many of the silver atoms in nanosilver are actually locked up inside. So you can, if your frame of reference is a bulk material, sure, silver is smaller and has enhanced activity. But if your frame of reference is the chemical toxicant, well, then silver is big. And in Greek, um, nano may mean dwarf. But in chemistry, nano really means big, right? People think it means small, but it means big, because most chemists work on molecules. And molecules are less than, less than one nanometer, typically. So the chemist's perspective on nano is a, a nanochemist is someone who takes molecules and assembles them into larger structures. And they can, be, they can become less active, right? And that's the case with nanosilver. This is um, every atom of silver in this ion in a conventional silver salt could be bioavailable. But if you pack it into a particle, many of the particles, many of the atoms are inside and unavailable. So this material is actually less active intrinsically than the conventional toxicant. And that's what most of the data is showing. So um, silver is a conventional heavy metal toxicant. And is it just a source of silver plus? That's quite possible. And that gives us a way to look at it. Let's start with silver plus and what we know about that and consider how nanosilver modulates the risks associated with the known heavy metal toxicant, silver. And there's still issues, though. One of those is whether this uh, silver particles, if they get out in the environment, um, will they somehow take different uh, fate and transport routes than um, silver plus? They could end up, say, in bacteria and then biomagnifying into small fish and large fish and to, and to seabirds, et cetera. So one of the questions that we've been trying to answer is do nanosilver particles behave as these persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals? That's something where the particle form could really make a difference. And so this is a graduate student in my lab who's been studying sort of the ion partitioning in nanosilver, and she makes these nice nanosilver particles, puts them in solution filters out the particles themselves and looks at the ion that's associated with the particle. So what determines the ion that could be associated with the particles in solution? It turns out to be this. If you wash all the ions out to begin with, you'll see that nanosilver slowly develops silver ion over time, uh, up to, say, a full day. If you remove oxygen from the water, that stops. It's also highly pH dependent. Low pH favors the production of ion. It turns out to be a chemical reaction. It's not a catalytic reaction. It's, uh, silver acts as a reductant. It reacts with oxygen and water. It's a kind of nano-corrosion, right? Silver nano-corrodes in the presence of oxygen and, and protons to slowly release silver ion. It produces these peroxy intermediates. They turn around and attack silver again to produce more silver ions. So that's the source of silver ions in a nano-silver colloid is air oxidation, kind of nano-corrosion. And if you ask the question about this, this reaction, how far will it go? Well, thermodynamics actually predicts this reaction will go all the way if there's any oxygen present. And our data backs that up. If you incubate silver for long enough, depending on its size, you get complete dissolution. So nanosilver may start out as a particle, but in a relatively reasonable amount of time, depending on conditions, it is gone. It completely transforms through O2 proton-mediated oxidation into conventional ionic silver. So I think it's kind of important implications. One, it, it means that the nanosilver particle phase will not typically pre be persistent in the environmental, in the environment if it lands in compartments that contain significant oxygen. So nanosilver directly is less toxic than conventional silver. It's a source of silver ions. And it's very likely when it gets into the environment, it will transform into those silver ions again. And that gives us some basis, I think, to think about the risks associated with nanosilver that are different than the paradigm I've been hearing, which is let's start with a large material and look at the unique properties of the small material. Let's start with the ion. Let's start with the actual chemical toxicant and build it up and look at the difference between those two cases. And we'll come closer to the truth and we'll get there faster.
than if we took the other route. That's my largely unjustified opinion. So um, how am I doing? When this is near the end. Um, so we also work on carbon nanotubes in the lab. And here the issue is very different. Our last speaker talked some about this. It's a completely different issue. It's got to do with the fiber pathogenicity paradigm. And nanotubes have a physical similarity to asbestos. Um, generally, any fiber that is bio-persistent, so it remains in the lung, has a diameter less than 3 microns, so it can be respired into the deep lung, and has a length greater than 10 or 20 microns to impair the clearance by macrophages, is potentially pathogenic. And carbon nanotubes have those properties. They were known to have those properties at the very beginning. Um, and the kind of um, biological idea is that these macrophage cells, this is the asbestos part of, uh, fiber, try to f phagocytize the asbestos, cannot. They create free radicals, an inflammatory microenvironment that eventually converts a granuloma, say, into a tumor. This uh, bio-persistence of the material, asbestos will stay in the body for decades, gives it a chance to migrate from the, from the um, lung to the sac, the pleura, which surrounds the lung, or the um, peritoneum, which is the sac that surrounds the abdominal cavity, and can lead to the dread disease of mesothelioma associated with fibers that migrate from the lung. And uh, so this issue um, uh, is one of the most interesting issues in nanotox right now, but it's a very specific one. It's about can carbon nanotubes, in fact, translocate from the lung to the pleura, or to the uh, diaphragm, or to the peritoneum? And um, if they're there, can they really induce this disease? It's not entirely clear if the surface chemistry or the composition of the material plays a role. Carbon, nano, carbon nanotubes are long, they're thin, they're likely to be persistent. But do they also have the inflammatory kind of reactions at their surface that asbestos does that can produce this kind of, of, of reaction? So here, a lot of progress is being made through the analogy between nanotubes and asbestos. If we start with that analogy and critically examine it, we can make property, uh, progress. And one of the interesting questions is whether nanotubes really are bio-persistent. It's widely thought that they are. Uh, but we did some work in our lab that I think you might find interesting. Um, there's no doubt that carbon, fossil charcoal, sits in the earth for millions of years. It doesn't degrade. And nanotubes can't dissolve at any kind of finite rate. But they can, in principle, be oxidized. So we set up a system where we generated like physiological oxidants that simulate what happens in a lysosome of a cell or a phagolysosome and looked at a whole bunch of different kinds of nanotubes to see if they degrade. And some of them actually do. It turns out that these, of all these different types of nanotubes, these show de degradation. And they've all been modified to put carboxyl groups on their surfaces. So uh, this is just one slide on this. But this shows the degradation of carboxylated nanotubes over time in like a 90-day assay in this uh, uh, acellular simulant fluid. And what we think happens is that when you modify nanotubes, you often add something to the surface. And you sort of <clears throat> change the properties, but you leave the backbone bonds intact. But when you carboxylate a nanotube, you need three bonds for the backbone carbon. <clears throat> you create collateral damage in the nanotube. You break two backbone bonds, and you make these things um, unstable. And then further mild oxidation can degrade them into these products. And we think this could open up um, routes for um, biodegradable, non-biopersistent nanotubes that might have some applications in biology and medicine. So with those little examples, of quirky things from our lab, um, let me ask this question about whether you can design nanomaterials for safety. There's two schools of thought with strong opinions. And I don't know the answer to this, and I guess no one else does either, but I wonder if it depends on this, whether or not the unique feature of the nano, nanomaterial that you've designed it for, whether it's plasmon resonance or being a one-dimensional conductor or being an antibacterial agent, is that feature of the material the same as the feature that triggers the adverse biological responses? If that's the case, then we have really no choice but to control exposure. Then we need to know more about the product life cycle and how the material gets out in the environment and where it will go and what, how it will transform. But in many cases, and we've seen some in this um, talk today, the answer is no, that the property that you want in the material is somehow different than the property that triggers the adverse biological response. And uh, in that case, we can redesign or formulate for improved safety. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think another example are quantum dots. Quantum dots provide stable fluorescence, right? Well, fluorescence doesn't make a material toxic, right? If quantum dots are toxic, it's because they release cadmium. So now, that may be hard to reformulate, but in the larger view, can't nanoscience produce, using the confinement principle, quantum dots of a different chemistry that can produce stable fluorescence uh, and not be toxic? And the answer is, I think so. So there's, I think, a, a wide opening for the long term for nanoscience to produce functional and biocompatible or safe nanomaterials if we continue to work on it.
Okay, so um, I just thank all my collaborators. We don't grow any living thing in my lab. We work entirely through uh, biological collaborators, and we do the materials chemistry. So it's been fun uh, if people are willing to tolerate us, which some are. And uh, I'll just leave up these conclusions to talk about if you'd like to, and would take uh, any questions you'd have. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. That was, um, I think, really helpful uh, and in some cases even uh, provocative. The nano silver example, I'm from ASU and so I'm very familiar with Paul and we work very closely with this uh, student, Troy Ben, who was in fact the one who cut up the socks oh, okay, good. Um, and tossed them into the washer and brought them over to the, uh, nice. to the scanners. A um, famous, famous person. And one of, the, one of the concerns there, I mean, I, I understand your story and like the, the switch of perspectives from the big to the small from, and from the small to the, the big at the nano scale. Um, but uh, one of the concerns is not just of bioaccumulation, but um, of the sort of intermediary between the washing machine and the environment of the wastewater treatment plant. And your story of nanoparticles releasing silver ions until the nanoparticles themselves disappear over what looked to be quickly from the graph 120 day period doesn't give me uh, great feelings of, of security with respect to wastewater treatment. No, you're right, and, and we, we put that in our paper as well. So, you know, I think in the long run, if the particle lands in an aerobic environment, it will not be persistent. But those times are significant, right? So it leaves open a pretty big window of time for nanosilver to do something different than ionic silver would have done. Down the drain it goes, you know. It may end up, uh, maybe may picked up by an organism before it has a chance to dissolve. It may, it may end up in some anaerobic compartment and stay there forever. So, you know, as usual, we never have a final answer to these things. And, but I think it's nice to focus this field now on the comparison between those two things, ionic silver and nanosilver, and ask in that window of time that nanosilver remains a nanoparticle, what could it do and where could it go? And, but most of its effects at the end of the day, at least most of them, will be due to the release of silver ions, which are the toxic species, from that place where it has resided. So there's more work to do, and wastewater is an important uh, an important area to look. But certainly thinking about larger silver, bulk silver is not so useful, but thinking about what we do know about silver as an ion or a salt gives us a kind of a framework from which to look at the critical differences, the same way that nanotubes and asbestos give us a framework to look at the critical differences and make some progress in this very complex area. Quick, just a quick question. Um, the polyequilibria that exists when you de deal with silver in a physiologically simulate milieu, for example. It's a classic problem in pharmaceutics. When we dissolve a drug form, uh, we can create other insolubility problems. And so silver carbonate, silver phosphate, silver chloride, silver chromate, silver. I mean, all of these have very, very low KSPs. And so the question is, when you, when you claim you have free silver ion, and it goes all the way back to the wastewater treatment analogy, when you put this down the drain, you've got all kinds of funky things that are going on. And can you really claim that you've got any, got any free silver ion uh, or is it going to be complex and poly, no, polyequilibrium great... that are very difficult to model? No, it's a great question. And uh, in the environmental area, it turns out that the, constant, the relevant concentrations are so low that even all these complexes are soluble. You know, the AGCL at environmental concentrations of total silver is AGCL aqueous. It's interesting. So when I use silver ion as a shorthand form for all the complex forms, but under environmental conditions, it should remain soluble. But when you, now you go to medical applications, it's a lot different. If you put a silver salt into saline or a PBS or something, it's, it, it precipitates out. And so we're actually trying to now work on the kind of the complex and dynamic partitioning of silver in biological environments, which, in which all those uh, factors are extremely important. They're important in the environment too, but they still, the, the end product is soluble. But in the biological system, well, we know you put silver salt in cell culture medium, it crashes right out, you know. So it's an interesting, so somehow the part, portion of the silver that remains soluble is what's being active in those biological systems. And the rest forms some kind of reservoir that it's a pretty interesting, uh, as a chemist type person, it's you know, um, sort of deliciously interesting to look at. You know, and thank you for the comment. Yeah. Just a quick comment. And I want to thank you for a really great uh, talk and identifying a great opportunity. Now I don't have to spend as much time with it on my talk. And that is that 
at NIOSH were promoting for material scientists, uh, you being a great material scientist, a tremendous opportunity here that nanoscience, nanochemistry brings us in, in a concept we promote as prevention through design and moving the prevention opportunities for health, safety, and environmental impact all the way up to the molecular stage. So uh, you and I will probably need to talk about a future workshop we have that is attempting mm -hmm. to marry the material science at the molecular level and the facility design at the operating level. And I think it's a great opportunity and really shows a lot of great promise for, for a number of these materials. Thank, thank you for that. I know it's, um, there's some controversy about whether this is a, you know, working directly to mitigate toxicity or designing materials to be safe is a valid uh, research topic. And it hasn't been funded. There's been talk in Washington of a, a green nanotechnology center, but it hasn't come about. And it's, it's surprisingly controversial. And, and it makes sense that we would start with the idea of let's, let's document the risk and understand it, because it's so uncertain. But I think um, uh, Alfred uh, Nordman talked about how long it would take. You know, if we sit around and wait for the kind of conclusive scientific uh, consensus about most of these issues, we'll wait for a long time. So I think it makes sense um, in this uh, experimental culture that we have, uh, this experimental society, as we go forward to work proactively on making materials safe through whatever means we can by controlling exposure or improving purification or reformulating. I think there's a lot of things you can do. It's just often difficult to prove that the thing you did makes the material safe. You may have made it better or safer, but you can't so do something and then say, therefore, this material is fine to use. That's a hard thing to do. But I think it's a great research area, you know, so. I'd love to come to the workshop. So I have a quick biochemistry question. Yeah. How much of the, um, the uh, effect of the silver ions is coming from reactions with thiols versus the peroxides you showed being generated? Yeah, um, I don't know the answer to that, but the way these experiments are done in simple media. So oxygen attacks, generates peroxides, they come back and attack again, eventually a four electron transfer, you have four silver plus you know, that you've created. But what we think happens in the biological system is that those partition to thiol groups, that KSP is really, or that uh, the binding co coefficient is very large. So it, silver likes chloride, but likes thiols even more. So I think there's a slow transfer to thiol groups. And so you can deactivate various enzymes. And one of the antibacterial mechanisms would be to deactivate uh, this NADPH hydrogenase, which um, in the electron transport chain, and then you get endogenous free radical production. And, they would help to dissolve the nanosilver, certainly. Oh, th th that is the other mechanism, right? So people say, oh, um, silver particles may attach to the membrane and generate ROS. And I think they do, but the, and the ROS is coupled to the ion release, right? It's not a catalytic, I don't think, event. It's that the oxygen generates an, a silver ion plus a peroxide intermediate. So I don't, I'm not able, that could be very important. I don't know, you know. I know thiol groups. Um, can protect many systems from thil silver toxicity. So if you add cysteine, if you add glutathione to a system, you can reduce silver's toxicity by you sequestering. Did, you did in the presence of catalase to remove the hydrogen peroxide, then you'd know the direct effect of the, uh, of the silver. Right. If we put catalase in, it does reduce the um, rate of oxidation of the silver. But we haven't gotten to the, we haven't graduated the point of treating living organisms with silver, because we kind of focus on the one thing at a time, you know, rightly or wrongly. So, yeah. One last question, yeah. Hey, if I'm the FDA and somebody comes to me with a product that is nano silver as a carbon nanotube, what do I do? I have to either approve it or not approve it. And given all of your work and what we've heard, what do I do? You just won't, you just won't give up on that, will you? <laughs> A single, one-track mind. Right, no, I mean, I, I don't, I'm really not an expert in regulation or law. I don't, you know, but I, I just think that in a, those, are, those are materials, unique materials. And so I think it's not so useful to say, well, if it gets below 30 nanometers, then we have an issue. I, I, I know that's a bad idea because the carbon nanotubes that have caused all the fracas with mesothelioma last summer have a diameter of 90 nanometers. So if you're waiting, you know, if they would be the most famous uh, nanotox case that we have today would be outside of any paradigm that was based on some, you know, 30 nanometer cutoff for unique nano effects that would occur. So I, I, some of these effects we say aren't even really size related. You know. So I think if there's a material like carbon nanotubes and there's some evidence coming from these chaotic studies that there is a concern, as there is with nanotubes, then I would think they'd be worthy of a careful consideration, but sort of material by material. Nanosilver as well it could be. It could be an environmental toxicant and is worthy of um, 
I think, some kind of regulatory consideration. What form that takes is another issue that is, is very difficult. Okay, um, we have a uh, break that is supposed to go till uh, uh, 10.50, but maybe we could go till 11. That would give us about 15 minutes, if that's promptly. All right, thank you.